Good morning. It's an honor to be involved in this program. I'm going to be speaking on a relatively touchy subject, which is race and prostate cancer. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I prepared a, a brief presentation. Uh, there's no way that um, that uh, in um, 10 minutes I can cover this topic in any kind of detail, but I'll do the best I can. So why are we talking about this topic? First of all, there are substantial differences in prostate cancer mortality rate, whether you adjust for affluent counties versus poor counties, African Americans still have a substantially higher mortality rate. And the question comes, well, what is race? And I believe race is a system for categorizing people, not a biologic, true biologic construct. Here's from a review article by Paul Hoffman published in 1994, who said on average, there's 0.2% difference in the genetic material between any two randomly chosen people on earth. That's only 6% uh, represents uh, differences between races. That's 6% of 0.2%. Race accounts for a minuscule 0.012% difference. Now, SEER data has been published for years showing a, a gap that's persisted, but the interesting thing is that the gap has been moving. And this implies that the genetics are not changing over time, but social circumstances are changing over time. Now, you have some publications that would argue that, you know, if we have a healthcare system that is the same for everybody and you see differences in outcome, it must be race. And here's one publication published in JNCI showing that Kaiser patients that were white did substantially better than Kaiser patients that were black. And the implication that these investigators concluded was that these findings are most consistent with the hypothesis of increased tumor virulence in blacks. Uh, the problem is that, and I wrote a letter to the, to, the, to the journal, and I said, if a difference in outcome equals a biologic difference, does the absence of a difference imply no biologic difference? And here I pointed out that if you looked at Kaiser um, whites and Kaiser blacks, Kaiser blacks did the same as non-Kaiser whites. So does this mean that somehow being non-Kaiser or Kaiser has something to do with your biology? So there are numerous examples of disparities in healthcare. For example, uh, there was an article in JAMA looking at coronary revascularization among Medicare A enrollees, and the whites were more likely to have such procedures performed. Another study from JAMA the blacks were 33 to 54% less likely to undergo cardiac catheterization, coronary angioplasty, and receive a cabbage than whites, even in the VA system. Now, people have argued that these are genetic differences that are important, and there are genetic differences. Clearly, if you look at people, you see some people with blue, blue eyes and blonde hair, uh, dark skin, and so forth. But these things represent polymorphisms that uh, don't necessarily affect systems. And here's an example where people showed that CAG repeats, CAG repeats are part of the genetic information, were significantly different in terms of short CAG repeats and long CAG repeats between blacks and whites. But they did not correlate with Gleason score, the PSA, the stage, and they did not correlate with outcome. And in fact, if you look at uh, internationally, um, blacks from the US have a better survival rate than whites and Asians in many other countries, suggesting that social circumstances are far more likely to have an impact on outcome than anything else. And if you look at SEER data and you look at outcomes, I, in this case, I picked the year 1988 to, to look at, you can see that whites in 1988, about 35% had no treatment compared to more than 50% of blacks. If you looked at aggressive treatment, there were clear differences in outcome, and these are not accounted for in some of the SEER statistics that you see for when they talk about survival rates. Now, what's my hypothesis? I believe that um, chronic stress affects the environment. And this is uh, some work done by others showing that it affects the immune system, blood uh, vasculature for tumor, and um, 
potentially could explain some of the differences in the incidence and the outcome. Now, how do you measure chronic stress? This is an example of work done with mice, put in cages. You can see that if you take mice and you and put them in cages and then you restrict their, their movement as shown in the bottom right, this induces a more stressful uh, experience for the mice measured by various markers like adrenaline. And here you see uh, tumor weight in these mice, those who had chronic stress had bigger tumors and a larger number of tumor nodules than those with less stress. There are other examples looking at the proliferation of viruses and proliferation of other markers associated with immune suppression related to stress. And then they've done work in patients with, uh, for example, ovarian cancer. They, they matched 10 patients, uh, five with high social support and low depression and high with low social support and high depression. And they performed various tests on these patients. And if you looked at markers for stimulating the immune system, there was a clear difference showing more uh, promotion of precancerous uh, changes with those who are depressed with less social support. Now, the most accurate way of trying to figure out whether race is important is to look at patients that are treated on phase three prospective randomized trials where you can adjust for all the features of the patients coming in and then you adjust for treatment and then you do systematic follow-up. And this is from a slide I made a couple of years ago that summarized the results of 12 randomized trials, all of which uh, reported outcomes by race and only one of them, the study by Thompson et al, showed that Blacks had a worse survival. Eight of them showed no difference in outcome, and the ones I show in yellow actually showed that African-Americans did better on the randomized trials. So the preponderance of the evidence from phase three randomized trials when you adjust for quality of care suggests that there's no difference in outcome. Now, I would argue that this experience, this experience with, uh, with, with racism has been around for many years since slavery times. Uh, in the post-slavery and Jim Crow era, and has continued with the development of a, the criminal justice system that we currently have here. In the U U.S. makes up about 5% of the world population, but only 25% but of the world's prisoners. The lifetime risk of being incarcerated, one in 17 for whites, one in three in blacks. Blacks make up 40% of those incarcerated, but only 6.5% of the general population. And this was caused by the so-called war on crime, three strikes you're out, mandatory sentencing, minimum, minimum sense of, uh, sentencing. But in addition to this whole issue, there are differences in hypertension, diabetes, COVID-19, strokes and unemployment. There are differences in severity of prostate cancer related to uh, uh, the neighborhood of deprivation. And there's a, there's a philosophical uh, term that we use called Occam's razor, which basically says the simplest explanation should be considered in the plausibility of a hypothesis. That is, if you can come up with a unifying hypothesis to explain all of this pathology, you should do that. And I would argue that this uniform pathology is racism. So when people say Blacks inherently have more aggressive prostate cancer, I also remember when people said Blacks were too dumb to play basketball, um, too uh, dumb to play quarterback, too dumb to play golf, too dumb to be president, and too dumb to play baseball. And we certainly know that none of those things are true. From a famous alumnus of mine, of all the forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Um, I think that the issue of race and racism and prostate cancer um, has not been appropriately dealt with. Thank you for your attention. Mac, thank you for that, uh, that nice talk. Um, I guess one question I have for you is what can be done? So you, you've, you've demonstrated some of the disparities uh, kind of in the context of prostate cancer, what next? Well, there's hope in the next generation. I, I encourage people, if you haven't watched it on Netflix while we're all in pandemic, still a little bit of lockdown, 13th, it's about the 13th Amendment. It marches through the history of what's happened in this country. And you also might want to look at the, the 14th, but the 13th and make sure that our children watch these things.
you know, one of the problems is that when people drive through the tenderloin of San Francisco, they see a disproportionate number of people lying on the streets who are African-American and they don't know the history behind the stuff. They go, there's got to be something wrong with these people. Why are they, you know, how did they end up at this? this you know, and, and they don't understand the victim versus the circumstances. So education for young people to understand how we got where we are and then moving forward to be part of the solution, you know, by being involved in politics and other things. Thanks, Mac. Uh, that, that's inspiring. 